All right, team. <clears throat> we are jumping into the next chapter. And we're leaving behind all that we've done with probability and statistics and sets, probability, uh, even uh, straightforward algebra. We're going into something completely new, completely fresh, and quite a bit different uh, than what you've been doing. So this could be refreshing to some and maybe uh, vexing for others. So what we're going to be talking about in chapter 11 is the uh, mathematical study of logic. Okay, so logic is uh, has two different meanings, a sort of colloquial meaning and a formal meaning. So colloquially, we think of logic as just that <clears throat> sort of uh, discipline by which we reason our way from a premise to a conclusion, which is a lot like what we do in formal logic, except in formal logic, we have rules that we have to um, <clears throat> operate according to in order to make meaningful statements, logical statements. So what we're gonna be doing in this first section is <clears throat> moving from uh, making logical statements in plain old English to writing them symbolically. So we're just going over how we translate English statements into symbolic statements. Okay, so formal logic, symbolic logic has three basic building blocks, what we call statements, what we call connectives, and what we call the are um, and the rules for evaluating the truth of statements <clears throat> that are put together using these connectives. So basic definitions here: a statement is a declarative sentence that is either true or false. Okay. So an example is George Washington was the first president of the United States of America. This is a declarative statement. I'm making a declaration about a quality that George Washington possessed. Uh, or a status that George Washington possessed at the time. And there's a clear truth value to the statement. So this is a true statement, as we know, this is uh, a reflection of historical fact. Uh, so we can uh, assign a truth value to this statement. All right. So any logical statement must be declarative and must have a clear truth value. So nebulous or subjective statements do not count as logical statements. They need to be based in fact or based in something that we can actually assess the truth of. So <clears throat> from simple statements, we can build more complex statements called compound statements. And these compound statements are formed by combining simple statements using connectives like and, or, not, and if, and then. Okay, so <clears throat> an example of a compound statement is the number six is even and the number five is odd. So we have two simple statements here. This is a declarative, the number six is even, and it has a truth value, uh, is a true statement. The number six is an even number. And then we have a second statement, the number five is odd, declarative and has a truth value. And then we have a connective, which fuses the two statements together to make a compound statement. Again, uh, another example, Tom Jones does a term paper or, takes the final exam. So these are both simple statements. Tom Jones does a term paper or takes the final exam. And these two simple statements are fused together with a connective or. <clears throat> okay, so connectives are really the uh, the main game here 
understanding how we use connectives to translate English statements into symbolic statements um, is what this first section is all about, really. So <clears throat> there are three primary or basic connectives. The first connective is a, what we call a conjunction. This is equivalent to the English word and within a statement. And in order to represent it symbolically, we use this carrot. So the up facing arrowhead. So that's our and. Now we have a uh, corresponding opposite connective called the disjunction. <clears throat> this corresponds to the English word or, and we use an upside down carrot or down facing arrowhead to represent the statement, uh, the, the connective or. So this is directly opposite to the up-facing one. <clears throat> and we should, and this is on purpose because conjunction and disjunction really are sort of opposite operations. And then finally we have negation. Negation corresponds to the English word not. And in order to uh, represent it symbolically, we use this squiggly or what is formally called a tilde. This comes before the symbol for the statement in order to negate the statement. So let's look at an example. We're gonna let the letter P represent the statement, Ina likes popcorn. And we'll let the letter Q represent the statement, Fred likes peanuts. So if I start with the compound statement, Ina likes popcorn and Fred likes peanuts, I can represent this symbolically by first putting a P in place of Ina likes popcorn, and a Q in place of Fred likes peanuts. And then in place of the connective and that's in the statement, we use the caret. So P and Q in this context is equivalent to Ina likes popcorn and Fred likes peanuts. Another example would be uh, Ina doesn't like popcorn. This is the negation of the statement P, Ina likes popcorn. And so in order to represent it symbolically, we use the connective negation symbol in front of the letter P. So not P, that's how we would read this, not P. Not P is the negation of Ina likes popcorn, which is Ina does not like popcorn. Okay. Now there's one more important connective, very important connective, and that's called the implication. Implication is represented by this double arrow symbol. Typically, this is what I've always seen, although your book and the, um, the quizzes may just use a simple arrow, but I don't like that. I think it's a little confusing and also, um, I use so many arrows in my notes that I don't like to use a simple arrow because it could, I could be misleading in this context, uh, in this logic con context. So <clears throat> I will always use this double arrow, but know that it is equivalent to just a simple arrow that you'll see in the homework and the quizzes and the textbook. Okay, so this double arrow that I'll be using is equivalent to the English statement, if fill in the blank, then this consequence. So if this happens, then uh, if X happens, then Y will happen. That structure, that um, sentence structure can be captured by the simple double arrow symbol. So an example, if P then Q or P implies Q is equivalent to if P then Q. Okay. We generally read this as P implies Q. So <clears throat> to close out section 11.1, let's do some more complicated examples of translating English statements into symbols, okay? So for all three of these examples, we're gonna let the lowercase w represent the statement, the train stops in Washington, and the lowercase n represent the train stops in New York, okay? So first, let's look at the statement. The train stops in Washington, but not in New York. So first, let's identify the simple statements involved. So we have 
the train stops in Washington, we know that that corresponds to W. <clears throat> and then we have in New York, which is really a shortening of the train stops in New York. So we know that this corresponds to the letter N. So we have W something N. <clears throat> now I chose this example because here the English doesn't directly correspond to the other connectives that I've already des described. So we've really got two connectives here, the but and the not. Now we know how to deal with the not. The not we give use a tilde. But what about the but? What is the how's the but functioning here? Well, notice that this sentence would be fundamentally unchanged if I wrote it instead of using a but, I use an and. The train stops in Washington and not in New York. So nothing has changed about that statement functionally. So when you see a but, oftentimes it's standing in place of an and. And an and is a conjunction, which you use the upward facing caret to denote. So if we put this all together, this whole thing will be equivalent to W and not N. Okay, let's try another one. The second statement says the train stops in Washington or New York, but not in both. Okay. So <clears throat> let's see what we got here. The train stops in Washington. We know that that corresponds to W. New York, or the train stops in New York, corresponds to N. And those are connected with the connective OR, which we know is a disjunction, which is denoted with a down facing caret. So right off the bat, we've got one complete compound statement, W or N, that's its own statement. So when I write that down, I'm going to put that in its own parentheses, okay? So it's its own statement. W or N. So what follows? Okay. So we have the but not again. So we know how to deal with the but not. So that should be a and and then a tilde. But what is the tilde, the not, affecting? It's affecting or qualifying the statement in both. So how do we represent both? Well, this is a very succinct way in both of denoting the statement W and N, right? So if we're stopping in both places, then we're stopping in Washington and in New York. So that whole, that one, those two little words represent a whole compound statement, which is W and N. So when we put this together, we have W or N and not W and N. So, and not, and that not is negating the whole statement W and N. So sometimes taking what seem like simple English sentences and translating them into symbols can be a little bit more complicated. We have to start thinking in terms of uh, compound statements that are nested in bigger compound statements. So this, this whole statement is one big compound statement, but within that statement, we have two smaller compound statements. 
Okay, so last example. If the train stops in New York, then it does not stop in Washington. Okay, so what do we got? Train stops in New York. We know what that is. That corresponds to N. Then it does not stop in Washington. So stop in Washington is our W. We have some connectives here, right? So we have the if then structure. So those, even though they're separated quite a, uh, a distance apart, those are both summarized simply with the implication arrow. So if then, we have the implication arrow. <clears throat> and then finally, it, it does not. So not, I'll just focus on the not. We know not is a tilde. What is the not, what are we negating here? We're negating stop and W, so not W. So what do we have? If N, then not W. So if N, then not W. So this is just a few examples of how to translate English sentences into compound statements using logical symbols. So this is something that you're gonna to have to get comfortable with and it can get a little bit more complicated sometimes. So uh, hopefully it won't get very much complicated than this middle example. Okay. So now we're going to move on to section 11.2. Now in 11.1, we were just primarily concerned with taking English sentences and translating them into symbols. We were not concerned with evaluating the truth of the given statements. It is possible to make a statement, a logical statement that can never be true. And it's, a, it's also possible to make a logical statement that can never be false. And then there's also a possibility that we can make a statement that is sometimes true and sometimes false. So how do we know when it's true, when it's false, et cetera? The main tool at our disposal to evaluate the truth value of a statement is what we call a truth table. So first, some basic defini definitions. A statement form is an expression formed from simple statements and connectives using the following rules. Okay. So <clears throat> anything that we call statement form can be formed. Uh, first, we say a simple statement is a statement form. So just any old basic statement qualifies as a statement form. If P is a statement form, then so is not P. So the negation of P will also be a statement form. And if P and Q are statement forms, then so is P and Q, P or Q, and P implies Q. All of these are also statement forms. So this, is, this definition really doesn't say a whole lot. All we're saying is if we start with a simple logical statement, we can build up more logical statements using connectives. No, nothing very <coughs> enlightening there, right? So we've already seen some examples in the previous section, but here are a few other examples. So um, we have P, Q, and R in these two statements, and we could make uh, some statement forms like P and not Q implies R, or not P implies Q or not R. <laughs> so pretty complicated statements with lots of symbols, and these we call statement forms. So here's a, these are very complicated statements, and looking at them, we have no idea whether there's any way that these statements could be true. So as I said, there, there are possibility, it's possible to form logical statements that can never be true. 
And it's also possible to form logical statements that are never false or sometimes false and sometimes true. So if I'm see, looking at a, at a complicated statement, like one of these two statements, I can't just look at it and tell whether it's possible that it could be true. That's what we use truth tables for. So how to determine the truth value of statement forms? Truth tables. Okay, so we'll start with the most basic truth table. <clears throat> From now on, whenever you see these letters, P, Q, R, whatever, we'll refer to them as variables, logical variables. Why do we call them logical variables? Because the truth value of one of these letters can change. So the simple letter P can either be a true statement or a false statement. Okay, so we can start with a statement that has a truth value of its own. Uh, we call P a variable because it can either be true or false. So it varies between these two possibilities. So depending on the truth value of P, the simple statement form not P will have two different truth values of its own. So if, so if we say P is true, then not P must be false because this is the negation of P. So <clears throat> think of, use an example like what we saw in 11.1, say P is George Washington was the first president of the US. Right? This could be your P. So this is a true statement. So therefore the statement, George Washington was not the first president of the United States would be a false statement. And that's what we're capturing here. If P was a true statement, then not P is a false statement. Similarly, if we start with a false statement, say we start with the statement instead, George Washington was not the first president, say that was our P, then that would be false. Therefore, it's an occasion, George Washington was not, not the first president or George Washington was the first president would be a true statement. So depending on the value, the truth value of this logical variable P, the statement form not P will have two, two different truth values. So you can see how this works. If P is true, then not P is false. If P is false, then not P is true. Okay, so this is the most basic connective, the negation connective. Now let's just see what would happen if we look at the other three common connectives. So the and connective, the or connective, and the implication. Okay, so in all of these statements, we have two logical variables, P and Q. In order to write down a, log, a truth table with two variables, we're going to need four rows. How do I know that? Okay, so there are up to two variables in all of these various statement forms. So how many rows will I need? I will need two to the two, which is four. So this, the, two, the green two comes from the number of variables in the truths in the statement forms. So in general, if you wanna know how many rows, it's always going to be two raised to the power of the number of variables. Okay. So generally you won't have more than three variables. And if you have three variables and that's two to the three, which is eight rows. Okay. So 
pay close attention to this first part. Whenever you're making these truth tables, you're usually going to start off with some complex statement that you need to evaluate the truth of. You're going to look in that statement and identify all the unique variables. So in all three of these statements, there's only a P and a Q. So I have to have a column for those two variables, a P and a Q. Okay, now I need to assign all the various combinations of truth values to these two variables. And the way to do that without fail is to use this following pattern. I know there's going to be four rows. So what I'll do is I will write down two trues for P and then two falses for P. That gives me four. So I, I have twice as many, twi two, two, two trues, two falses. I'm then going to cut that in half for the Qs. So one true, then one false, then one true, then one false. By assigning the truth values in that pattern, I get all the possible combinations. So we have true, 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 false, false, true, and false, false. So that's, those are all the combinations of truth values for two variables. So you have to use that sort of pattern. If you had three variables, then you would have eight ro rows. And so the first P would have four trues, then four falses. Then the next letter would have two trues, two falses, two trues, two falses. And then the next letter would do true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false, you know, down the line. Okay. That's, that is always a given. This part, you, no thought is required. All you need to know is how many rows there are and then fill in the truth values with this pattern. Now we need to evaluate the truth value for these simple compound statements. So this, what I'm gonna show you here is a given. This is something that you need to memorize or reference as you work through more complex statements. These are, this is the basics of logic. So first we'll start with and. An and statement is only true when either both variables are true or both variables are false. Okay, so when both variables are true, then an and statement is true. If either variable is false, and the other variable is true, then an and statement is false. So true and false gives you false, false and true gives you false. However, and this is one thing that, that is a little tricky to understand, if both statements are false, then the and statement is true. Okay, so that takes a little bit of head scratching. Okay, next that, <clears throat> I had a feeling I was wrong about that, sorry. Uh, I had to check because I my, my brain misfired there. So that's not true. An and statement is only true if both pieces are true. Otherwise, everything is false. Okay, so please, please, please forget that. That was me being dumb. So, <clears throat> and statement only true if both elements are true. If there's at least one false, then everything is false. That's the way to think about an and statement. If there's at least one false, then the whole statement is false. Okay. The or statement is the opposite of the and statement. And so the, the way to think about the truth value of an or statement is in the opposite way. So where with an and statement, if there's at least one false, then the whole thing is false. With an or statement, if there's at least one true, then the whole statement is true. Okay. So we have true, true for P and Q. So P or Q is true. We have true, false. 
So there's at least one true that makes it true. A false true gives me at least one true, but false, false, there's no true present. So notice how these are opposite. You have true, false, 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 and here true, 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 false. Three trues and a false, or one true and three falses, directly opposite one another. All right. <clears throat> I, what I was getting confused on back in the end was the implication. So the implication is the one that is a little hard to understand exactly how it works logically. So we'll start with the easiest one. If you start with a true statement, <clears throat> a true statement implying another true statement gives you a true statement. Okay, so if you start with truth, you can get to truth. Think about that. Um, I also, the way I like to think about it is think about a work of nonfiction versus fiction or facts versus fiction. Okay, so think of truth here as fact and think as false as fiction. Can you have a work of nonfiction or a truth and inside of that have truth? Can you have fact within fact? Yes, that gives you truth. Now, can you start with something that's true and get to something that's false? Okay. So can't the, the way I like to think about it is, can you have a work of nonfiction with fiction inside of it? No, that's not allowed. You can't have fiction within fact. So that gives us a false. Now, here's the one that's tricky. False implies true. Can you have a work of fiction that has truth inside of it, that has facts within it? That you can have. So the idea is you can, if you start from fal a false premise, from a false idea, then you can always get to truth. You can always imply anything. And so this will actually give you a true statement. Sorry, I had to pause there. <clears throat> Someone was at my door. Okay. Um, so false can imply true. We can have truth inside of fiction. Okay. So bas the basic idea is we start with a falsity you can always get to a truth you can false can imply true or think of fiction versus fact now if we have a work of fiction can we also have fiction within the fiction yeah nothing wrong with that so that is also true so an implication is only false when you start with a true statement and you try to arrive at a false statement otherwise implications are always true no matter what the truth values are. So that's one of the harder ones. And this is actually supposed to, I was supposed to wait till section 11.3 to go over this, but I wanted to give it all up front so you could see the three, or really the four main um, connectives, the not statement, then the and, the or, and the implication all side by side. So to go over it again, an and statement, if you have at least one false, then the whole thing is false. For an or statement, if you have at least one true, then the whole thing is true. And for an implication, uh, you 
only get a false when you start with a true and you try to imply a false. Otherwise, you always get a true. So let's use this truth table idea to evaluate the truth of more, a more complex statement. So I'm gonna walk through this whole process for you here. Okay, so we're gonna build a truth table for this statement so that we can see when is it true and when is it false. So the first thing you need to do is identify the number of variables. So there's a P and a Q and there's a P, so there's only two variables here. So we only need to start with two basic columns, P and Q. How many rows do we need? That's two to the two, which is four. So four rows. Again, we'll start with true, true, false, false for the P, then true, false, true, false. Okay, so that's the very beginning of the truth table. Now, building up <clears throat> the truth table, we have to work our way from the inside out. Okay, so looking inside, what's the next most interior statement form? So really, the most interior statement form is the not Q that's inside of another bigger statement, which is the P and not Q. So I'm going to give not Q its own column. Okay, then the next layer is the P and not Q. So I'm like, un raveling the onion from the inside out. Not Q, then P and not Q. Then what's the next layer? <clears throat> we have a big or statement, but inside of that or statement, we have a negation statement. So the not P and not Q. And then finally, the, at the outermost layer, we have the complete statement. So from left to right, we're really building up the statement from the inside out. So <clears throat> we're gonna go through and assign truth values here. So starting from the left, not Q only depends upon the variable Q. And for the negation, you just flip all of the values. So false becomes true and true, sorry, and true becomes false. Okay, the next layer is an and statement, P and not Q. Now, in order to evaluate this and statement, you're going to work with these two rows, P and not Q. You still have the, the, the rules of the and connective, which say that if there's at least one false, then the whole thing is false. So you're looking at these two and evaluating. So true and false, there's at least one false. So this statement is false. True and true, no falses. So we get a true. False and false, two falses gives us a false. False and true, at least one false gives us a false. Okay, so we use these two elements. We only we just basically followed the rules for the and connective using these two rows, right? P and not Q. Now, in the next column, we're negating this statement, which is in the previous column. So all we have to do is flip all of the truth values for this column. So false becomes true. and true becomes false. Okay. And for the final column, <clears throat> we have a big or statement. 
one uh, one component of the or is whatever's in this column and then the other component is the p way back here so to evaluate the truth values in this column we're going to be using these two columns and comparing these two values following the rules of the or <clears throat> the rules for the or connective is that if there's at least one true <clears throat> then the whole thing is true okay so true and true gives us true true and false gives us true because we have at least one true false and true we have at least one true so we get a true and then false and true gives us a true again so make sure you check that true and true at least one true true false false true false true <clears throat> so at the very last column we got nothing but trues that is a very special outcome <clears throat> this by no means has to happen so for <clears throat> complex statements like this it's totally possible to get a false uh you know one of the results could be false in this case none of the results were false all the results were true <clears throat> when this happens it's very special outcome we call that a tautology okay so when you have a statement that's always true regardless of the truth values of the individual variables we call it a tautology <clears throat> so notice in this statement the variables are p and q we try all of the various combinations of truth values for p and q and no matter what their values are we got all truths for the more complex statement so that instance is what you call a tautology so no matter what it's always true <clears throat> the flip side of that is a contradiction so if we had got all falses here no matter what the assignments of truth values were we'd call that a contradiction so a contradiction is always false no matter the truth values of the individual variables so that's also a possibility and we call that a contradiction so here we had a tautology we could end up with a contradiction or we could end up with a mixture of truth and false that's totally feasible as well and there's nothing wrong with that <clears throat> okay so one last thing from this section and then i can let you go and you can get uh, going on some homework here shortly there's one more unique connective that we need to talk about which is what we call the exclusive or which we denote with uh, they at least in the boat book denote with a plus sign with a circle around it so the exclusive or so first let me say this that this symbol which we said was or is actually the inclusive or <clears throat> And it's inclusive because we don't care if we um, if both elements are true, a true or true still gives us a true. And that's not always what we mean in English when we use the or. So <clears throat> if you have kids, you you quite often give your kids options. You can eat the broccoli or you can eat the rice okay that, that's a bad maybe a bad example um you can you can wear your leggings or you can wear your jeans okay when you make that statement to your child you are not anticipating that they're going to say well i'll wear both and you wouldn't accept that as an answer. No, 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 you'll be too hot if you're wearing leggings and jeans. You have to choose one or the other. That is an example of an exclusive or. You cannot choose both. You must choose one or the other. So that means only one of those can be true. They can't both be true. If instead you're talking about the broccoli and the rice example, you can eat broccoli or you can eat rice. If your kid says, well, I'll eat both. And you say, okay, that sounds great. That's an inclusive or. They are allowed to choose both options. Two truths is also a true. 
with an exclusive or, that's not the case. So two variables, true, true, false, false, then true, false, true, false. With the exclusive or, we can only have one true at any time. So two trues for the exclusive or is a false. If there's only one true, then you get a true. And then of course, two falses makes a false. Okay, so that's just a, a slightly different connective and it makes good sense why we have to make a distinction between the exclusive versus the inclusive or. Think about the broccoli and rice versus the leggings and the jeans. In one case, you don't care if they choose both. In the other case, they have to choose one or the other. Okay, so that's 11.1 and 11.2. Everything you need to get going, not to mention a little, not to mention a little bit of 11.3. So um, your homework won't cover 11.3, which is all about the implication. I spent a little time on the implication, but I'll obviously spend more time on the implication. It's a more complicated connective. Uh, but otherwise, you're ready to get going and enjoy.